I think almost everybody here was with Ernst yesterday when he explained what had happened when his wife died. And his wife died not just in chronic pain, but severe pain. And not just grief came out from Ernst, but anger about it. And he told me afterwards this only happened two years ago, so I suspect it's quite raw emotions. Oh, one, of, one of the things that struck me, Ernst, is why didn't you remonstrate with the clinicians about it? Uh, it's very difficult because all those white things, color people, they all cover each other. And it's very difficult. It's a kind of tribal fight of the disciplines in the hospital. And uh, I think that, that, uh, that pain recognition and pain diagnosis and all that has to start on the first line. The first people who see the patient for the first time should already start it. And I was told that a lot of these people were invited to this Congress, presidents of the societies of, of, of oncologists or radiologists. They didn't even bother to answer the, the mails. That speaks for itself. That's really frightening. And it's beautiful to hear, because what I'm going to say is going to be a repetition of what I heard all day. We all know that we have to change. We all know where it is. But we just don't do it. We have the tools to fight pain. We have the um, medical things to fight pain. And we don't do it. What, what's wrong? I don't know. Lars, what do you think? I mean, you represent the Danish yes. group fighting for, for people suffering from, from chronic pain. What do you think? Well, firstly, tell us about your own experience, will you? Well, um, I had pain for the last 17 years. And... To tell you the truth, actually, it started like not like an incident for itself. It came along slowly. I did a lot of different kinds of sports. And it started locally, and then it kind of spread and became worse. It was a sports injury at first, was it? Yeah, I was doing like jogging and yeah. uh, windsurfing. So it started in uh, one of my shoulders and then moved to my forearms. And then gradually, it, it uh, became more widespread. And today, this is also why I'm sitting here with, you know, socks on, because um, I got this burning sensation on the skin. And this is also where I, why I also wear, like, long undies. It's not very sexy, but... You Just know. what Elliot was telling us about in the video at the beginning of the day, yes, the, 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 having the torch rather than the feather. Definitely. But there's a very big contrast between what I experience and what the doctors can measure, you know. And it, I think, you know, it takes time to, to change the way we perceive and view the world. And the way most doctors and physicians today, they were brought up with a, a biomedical uh, paradigm. And also, a self as patient were brought up with this paradigm like looking for a reason for things. So even I found, find myself sometimes doubting uh, other patients, their pain. I want to see some, you know, some, some reasons for it, some objective so somatic reasons. So even I have to be constantly aware of this, um, this inside of me in order to change it. I'm intrigued with what you say, though, here, because maybe there's some optimism in this. It is true, of course you're right, that clinicians are brought up on a biomechanical view. But on the other hand, increasingly, because of evidence-based medicine, clinicians are turning to an evidence-based view, and that's protocol-driven. And if we can get on that protocol, then we've really made a breakthrough. So maybe, although you're absolutely right, maybe we should not just be pessimistic about that, maybe there's an opportunity, I don't know. Robert, what do, well, actually, Robert, before I ask you a philosophical question about this, just tell us about yourself and, and the pain you've suffered and the responses you've got. From. Well, mine's quite an interesting situation in the sense that uh, I've lived with rheumatoid arthritis for nearly 60 years. Um, Did it start, for, it started as juvenile arthritis? Yes, then? at the age of three. Yeah. And for the first 20 years, I did exactly what my doctors said, which wasn't terribly effective in terms of non-steroidals and, and um, cortisone-type therapies and so on. And, and in fact, you know, some of those medications caused such side effects that it was a big 
effort to wean oneself off them. Um, but latterly, I have been a self-managing patient, and I have used complementary therapies alongside conventional therapy to help me manage the condition. And I think, actually, there are many people um, with chronic conditions who probably are not even telling their doctors but are trying some of these procedures. And actually, if we were able to research these procedures properly, embrace them into the conventional health system, I think a lot of people could have a lot of relief without necessarily pharma a pharmaceutical intervention or even surgery. I've asked you about your own personal experiences. Can I just ask you the question I asked the last panel? We want to make a change over the next year. What should we focus on, Ernst? Um, education, education and, 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 and uh, awareness. And, and attitude uh, and, and, and communication. I think that's a lot of it, that's, and, and that's why our foundation works uh, to, to help to make these things work. We're not trying to get anything away from here. We support the outcome of this here. Thank you. Lars, one thing, education, what should it be? If, if we're going to focus on one thing, well, just for next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it seems like it's, it's never a problem of coming up with ideas, you know. Uh, however, implementing in the real world, it, that's another thing. But I think uh, a very important thing is for some way to make people um, that don't have pain, politicians, doctors, understand what it does to people who lives with chronic pain. So if you could make that more visible, like telling the stories to them, um, making them feel that so they remember it. Because it's so, so difficult. We get, every day I, I watch the news, there's so many things for me to relate to. So it needs to be something personal that you will remember. I'm, I'm relieved at your answer. Halfway through, I thought you were going to say we should make them suffer pain themselves. <laughs> they know what it's about. But no, they, we should make them understand what it's like. And that's why... Of course, groups like yours are so important, and groups like, like yours, Robert. Over the next year, what should your priority? What would your priority be for for SIP? I think that we should come back to what was in the last uh, the last panel of speakers, and, and the building alliances. Um, it's it's alliances within your own groups, but it's also alliances with the broader patient community. And also, I thought you know you seem to quite like little images and metaphors. Um, the, uh, the doctor from Dorset who said that, uh, that maybe the reason why vets get so much more uh, pain training is because their patients bite harder. <laughs> I think perhaps um, the patients in the pain community should start biting harder. You should start being more vocal, more active in your campaigning. And I also think those of you who provide services to people with pain should also involve your patients much more in the design of the services that you produce mainstream in the UK now, there's this whole idea of co-production, where not only the patient and the doctor works together in terms of my individual treatment as a patient, but that the patients are much more involved in the design of services. They can fine-tune those services to make them much more effective and, and to by providing their own experience into that equation. Robert, Lars, as we need to leave it there. The three of you, thank you very, very much indeed.